Alrighty, welcome back. Uh, this week we're going to talk about Amador County. This is the county that I work in and, um, you know, currently at Villa Toscano and Bella Piazza wineries. Um, of course, there's a lot of wineries in this county. There's also two different ABAs. There's Fiddletown and Shenandoah Valley. Um, some of the things that I think of when thinking Amador, I think of the really intense, hot uh, summers that we get, as you guys have seen this week. While it's been up in the upper 90s in Placerville, excuse me, it's actually been, you know, 110 in Amador County. So um, definitely some really intense heat, and that affects the fruit in a lot of ways, too. Um, you know, we have lots of gold mines, um, you know, lots of mines kind of left over and people can tour, um, lots of caves. We have um, lots of snakes, <laughs> of course, and um, we also have the yearly Barbera Festival, uh, lots of um, larger wineries, um, some in distribution around the world, as we're going to find out. Um, but yeah, Amador County is, um, you know, in contrast to El Dorado County, the thing that makes it interesting is that El Dorado County has, you know, all of all of the hills and, and all of the valleys. Um, Amador County is, from what I've seen, mostly, mostly it's flatter overall. It's not as, it, there's not as, as much extreme change in elevation, um, and it's much hotter. So where we can grow a lot of different varieties in El Dorado County from all the different microclimates from all of those hills and streams and all those, the intricacies of, of the mountains up there, um, Amador is, um, I feel like, a lot more uniform in a lot of ways. And so you'll see a lot more, um, like, just straight-up Zinfandel and Barbera production down there as, um, or in Syrah as well, compared to El Dorado, which I feel like grows a lot more varieties. So anyways, I guess with that being said, let's just go ahead and jump in. Okay, so El Dorado County, the size of the county, 606 square miles. Um... There are over 40 wineries, so um, actually not quite as many as El Dorado. Let's see what we had for El Dorado. Uh, okay, 40 to 50 wineries in El Dorado, um, but over 70 different varieties were grown in El Dorado. For Amador, um, you know, we have over 40. As far as variety goes, um, I don't think I got complete information on that, but um, I don't think there are as many varieties grown here. I think I might have a slide with that later, but... Mostly we're known for um, Zinfandel, Barbera, and Syrah. Lots of history with Rhone varieties, um, Spanish and Italian varieties from the immigrants who came and originally planted them, of course, over 100 years ago. Um, the soil type is mostly decomposed granite and sandy loam. And this is one of the reasons that um, this county has so much history with grapevines. Um, that this is, so because of the soil type, the roots are able to penetrate deep enough and produce uh, the longevity of lifespan for a grape vine. So because of the sandy loam and the decomposed granite, it's, it's very um, penetratable, I guess you could say. So that really helps um, achieve a long lifespan for grape vines to help them get through the drought years. They can reach water and just kind of um, overall keeps it around. So that helps. Um, elevation is between 250 and 2,000 feet above sea level. Um, so not even quite like we had at El Dorado County. Uh, elevation of the vineyards 1,200 to 3,500 feet above sea level. So definitely, um, you know, we're reaching the lower limits there. Um, for Shenandoah Valley, that's going to be more on the lower side. For Fiddletown AVA, that's going to be closer to the 16 um, to 1,800. So let's take a look here. Yeah, 1,600 feet uh, so specifically. 1,683 feet above sea level. As you can see, it's kind of more in this forested area on the map here compared to um, Shenandoah, which is on this uh, this side of the map, which is more of like the valley, hence Shenandoah Valley, AVA. Um, so Fiddletown, you're probably going to have expectations closer to some of the El Dorado County wines. Um, not fair play, but more of the El Dorado AVA itself. Um, so it's not quite up there to fair play, but it is one of the higher ones down there. And in comparison, Shenandoah Valley is uh, the lowest elevation in the Sierra foothills out of all of them. So it's kind of bizarre. You have El Dorado County just north of it and then Shenandoah below it. And you have high elevation and low elevation wines just within, you know, 45 minutes of each other. So that's kind of why I wanted to do Amador County next is as kind of a sharp contrast to El Dorado. 
and also um, because of tours and Zoom conferences we have scheduled as well. So just a little bit of information I found contrasting between Shenandoah Valley and Fiddletown AVAs. Uh, overall evaluation of the wine says or shows that stylistically Zinfandels from Shenandoah Valley tend to be fuller, riper, and earthier with a characteristic dusty dark berry fruit character, hints of cedar, uh, anise, and clove spice, and scents of raisin and chocolate. So I thought, I thought this was really interesting actually reviewing these slides after we did our Eldorado wine tasting because that kind of lines up with what we got from Eldorado wines um, for some of them. So um, I want to add in addition to that, if you're getting confused, I was just talking to a winemaker in um, up in Fairplay, and he, the one thing he had to say to add to this is, um, yes, they can be similar in that way, but one thing that's going to make the wines in Shenandoah Valley different from El Dorado is that um, they are much more jammy, uh, much more like fruity, fruity and intense fruit on the palate, even if it is kind of a darker berry, it's going to be jammier for sure, and that comes with the hot weather in the area. In addition, we're also going to have, um, in general, higher alcohol wines because of the intense heat. So um, they'll be hot and jammy overall, even with, in addition to the cedar, you know, raisin and chocolate. So Fiddletown, by comparison, is a smaller AVA. Um, it is a little bit higher elevation east of Shenandoah Valley, so this will tend to be lower in pH and display a fruitier um, more cherry-like tones, so different types of fruit, right? Even though if they both are probably going to be jammy, um, we're getting more acid from Fiddletown because of the higher elevation and the cooler nights. Um, that's the diurnal temperature exchange. Um, so instead of getting like, you know, this is kind of just like dark berries and chocolate, but you could think of like blueberries, blackberries. So those can be jammy, you know, if you've had blueberry jam before, but instead of that, it's going to be a little more acid. It's going to be a little bit brighter fruit. So think of like literal red fruit. So cherries, raspberries, um, pomegranate, etc. So that'll be good. So I don't have a Fiddletown ABA wine lined up in our tasting, but um, Rombauer Winery does have a Fiddletown Zin um, from what I've seen on their website. So I'm really hoping that when we do our tour on the 30th, that we can um, talk to the winemaker about Fiddletown, ABA versus Shenandoah and any thoughts that um, he or she might have on the matter. So that would be nice. Yes. Okay, another thing that Amador County is uh, very well known for is their Barbera Festival. So this is held every year. Um, and I've heard about it, but I never really like realized what a big deal this is. Um, over six street, over sixty wineries from all over California come every year, and this includes the Sierra Foothills, Napa, Sonoma, Paso Robles, Robles, uh, Mendocino, Livermore, Ventura County, Bay Area, and Lodi. And over two thousand people uh, come to this event every year. Of course, um, it's much more than just wine. Um, sometimes other wines are served in addition to beer. Uh, lots of really good food trucks, which I'm all about, uh, vendors, and artists. And it's held during September of every year. So it's actually a festival put on by Amador Vintners. So if you're interested, you can check out their website. Um, it's happening this year, especially with the mask mandate dropping. So uh, we'll have to see how that goes. But it looks like a wonderful time. Unfortunately, September is the peak of my workload. So I don't know if I'll be able to go but I would recommend it, of course. Okay, so in addition, so just kind of like how I was talking about um, the clay, this like the loam soils that are here in Amador County give it uh, longevity of lifespan for the grapevines. So, um, so we have a couple of things going for us. So in Amador County, it's actually, we have the oldest winery in California, and we also have the oldest vineyard in California too, on record, like recorded on paper. So we're going to talk about um, the oldest winery first, and in a couple of slides we'll get into the oldest vineyard. The oldest winery is the Diagostini Winery, um, and it was built in 1856 by a Swiss immigrant named Adam Linger. 1911, um, someone of oh, um, en Enric, Enrique, uh, 
D'Agostini purchased the winery, and then in 1961, it was granted as a California state landmark, number 762, uh, and also claimed that some of the original vines were still in production at the time, So, and that is still true to this day. Uh, Leon and Shirley Sobon have been the owners since 1977. It's currently known as the Sobon Winery. You can see it. It's just right on Shenandoah Road. Um, it's also known as... So they own Sobon, which is only open on the weekends on Shenandoah Road, but they also own Shenandoah Vineyards, which is off of Steiner Road. Sorry, you can't really see that because my chair is in the way. There you go. It's off of Steiner Road. So um, definitely check it out. They also... Um, Inside, it's also a museum, so I think I say that in my next slide. Yeah, so if you go inside, this is the entrance, and this is kind of an overhead shot of, um, the you know, the original production. So this front building is what you see uh, up here to the left, this guy. Uh, so this building is um, kind of where the tasting room is and also where the Shenandoah Valley Museum of Early Agriculture and Winemaking is. So if you're interested in diving even deeper, into that, um, I would suggest going over there on the weekend and asking some questions. But um, they actually do include some really nice uh, wines, wines that I would say that are typical, typically do well in the area. Sorry, I'm going to adjust my size there for a second because I'm in the way. Um, and those wines, of course, include Zinfandel and Barbera. They also uh, produce Primitivo, Syrah, uh, Roussan, Viognier, and Chardonnay. And none of these surprise me because these are would all do very well in the um, high temperatures. So definitely check them out. The cool thing about Sabon Winery is they are, um, they actually um, distribute worldwide. So um, we're actually gonna be able to Zoom and have a conference with either the son or, or the father. Um, I think it's going to be uh, potentially Leon, we'll see. Uh, and they're gonna be able to present to us the winery and talk about um, their history and what they do, but they, you know, uh, when I was talking to the son, he was telling me, and I'm totally blanking on his name right now, um, he it was very intimidating because he was really intelligent. Um, he was a graduate from UC Davis, got his master's in viticulture and enology. Um, he also speaks many different languages, um, Asian languages, so um, he deals with, like, the foreign trading um, across across seas with all those other countries. So uh, really remarkable stuff. Um, they're kind of all over the map, and that's not something, you know, people really talk about. So um, for wines for Saban and Shenandoah Vineyard, like I said, Zin and Barbera, they also produce an orange muscat and a black muscat, and I would imagine these wines to be pretty sweet. Um, Roussan, Tanat, Carignan, Malbec, Pinot Noir, and I, for whatever reason, I typed Malbec again. I guess I was tired. Uh, but yeah, they have a really beautiful label. Uh, most of the Saban stuff and the Shenandoah vineyards kind of look like the center guy right here. But some of the stuff that they produce that is in distribution is closer, you know, to this really beautiful kind of watercolor uh, label as well. So it's very nice. Um, okay, oldest vines in California. Um, Steiner Road is was one of the first the first wine trail in Amador County. So some of the oldest grapes in California are planted there and that includes the original Grand Père OGP vineyard. That was planted in 1866. Um, the only reason that we know about it is because it was documented in a US Geological Survey in 1869. So I guess people were out there taking a survey and just like in a footnote or something they were like Hey, by the way, there's a vineyard out here. Uh, yeah, interesting. So that's one. Of, that's the oldest documented vineyard in California. Uh, it's very isolated, uh, but on, but as of now, um, Scott Harvey owns it, and he is the one who gave it the name, uh, the original Grand Pair. Uh, only four wineries are allowed to use his grapes, and it's Andis, Scott Harvey, of course, Vino Nichetto, and um, Makia, which is in Lodi. So anyways, here's here's a map of Steiner Road. Here we go. Uh, you can see it kind of loops around. Shenandoah Road is also is kind of the newer main drag of wineries. But if you go down Steiner, um, you know, it's a really nice kind of deep tour within all these other wineries here. Charles Spinetta makes some really good sweet wines if you're interested in him. Um, Deborah 
Zemlija or Dobra Zemlija Winery, I heard is a, I have not had the time to go there yet, but I've heard that they do a lot of um, native fermentations. So that means it's a winery that um, instead of adding yeast to, you know, the must or to a tank of wine that's fermenting with all the grapes and everything in it, it just um, lets the yeast that are present native on the grapes kind of take over and ferment naturally. So, I mean, they're both natural, but one is used with the yeast that's already found in the vineyard. So that's kind of, it's a very interesting kind of different take. Um, a lot of people do do that now, but I don't think a lot of people in Amador necessarily do that. So, and the reason for that, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. The reason for that is because we have such high alcohol wines that native yeast typically will not carry it all the way to 15% plus. Normally, a lot of like, a lot of native yeast will start dying off at 15%. Um, so you're going to have some residual sugar and that wine will not complete fermentation. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> okay. Get a sip of water. Okay. Original Grand Pair Vineyard. Established in 1866, still active today. So this is kind of uh, post-harvest. You can see there's a couple of grapes left behind, uh, clusters that I guess they didn't think were good. These vines kind of look gnarly a little bit, um, you know, um, Halloween-esque, kind of cryptic out there. But, um, yeah, you can tell by look how thick, you know, look how thick these uh, cordons are, look how thick the scion and, you know, the vine is itself, this has seen many, many years, and, you know, potentially, it, who knows, it could have been abandoned at one time, so it's interesting to see, like, the upkeep, people, you know, still active today, it is slowly dying, so it might, it'll probably not be active, you know, for who knows until how long, uh, we have, how much longer, we don't know how much longer we're going to have for these grapes, is what I'm trying to say, so if you get a chance to go down to Scott Harvey or Vino Nocetto and talk to them, then, um, I definitely do it, you know, see if you can get this. It's it's expensive, of course, but uh, this is a designate vineyard that you can put on the bottle. So um, in 2016, the original Grand Pair was voted as the vineyard of the year. The original planters are not known, but through some research, a lot of people narrowed it down to the Upton family. And a lot of sources will tell you just straight up it was the Upton family, but that's as close as they got, so that's still not completely confirmed. Uh, like I said before, it's currently owned by Scott Harvey. He named the vineyard Grand Père to honor its age, which means grandfather in French. So um, these are kind of the labels that are used that are made with that wine. Um, 1869 is a very popular one, and then here's the Vino Nocetto uh, label for it as well. So, yeah, that's something very uh, beautiful about that. Okay, so now to where I work. Sorry, my allergies are killing me. Okay, Villa Toscano, Bella Piazza. They're sister wineries. They're owned by Jerry and Erica Wright. There's over 50 acres of vines, and they were planted in 1977. Um, they mostly focus on Italian-style wines, um, and they're really big on... Um, like the grandeur of like living in a beautiful place. Like if you ask them why they bought a winery, it won't be because they loved wine or they loved food. It was they wanted a beautiful place to live and they wanted to share that with other people. So the goal is when you come to Villa Toscana or Bella Piazza that you are transported somewhere else in the world. So uh, Villa Toscano, as you can see up here, is very much kind of like the like beautiful Italian, almost kind of opera-esque setting. Uh, Bella Piazza is just a little more European. Uh, you walk inside and there's like lots of flags hanging. And um, anyways, both of them have food options, live music, uh, very beautiful. But all both of the wines are made at the Villa Toscano location. So that's where all the operational equipment is. <clears throat> um, let's see. Oh, another fun fact about this is that Villa Toscano and Bella Piazza are one of the very few wineries that can call their wines port. Um, so 
We're going to learn about this when we do a lecture on sparkling wine and in labels. We're going to learn about port, sparkling regulations, um, you know, label requirements and designations. But we can't, if you were to open up a winery today and you were going to, you wanted to make a port, you could not make a port and call it a port. Port is reserved to Portugal, just like champagne is reserved for wine made in the Champagne Hills of France. So um, there was a period of time when they were reviewing the legality of this where you could be grandfathered in to calling your wine port if you were making port before, I think something like 2006, I think is when it went down. But you had to get some paperwork done and get, get it signed by someone important to be grandfathered in. So since they had been making port before 2006 and they were grandfathered in, um, they are allowed to call their wines port. However, um, there has been some uh, re like reper repercussions, repercussions for that or some kind of, um, what's the word I'm trying to say? They... You, so wines from Portugal are allowed to say like their designation, the vineyard, and like the variety that's in it. If you're trying to make port in the United States, even if you got grandfathered in, you're allowed to say port, but you aren't allowed to say the vintage. You aren't allowed to say the variety. All you're allowed to say is the, you're allowed to say port, you're allowed to say the winery name, and the fanciful name. So the fanciful name would be like Dancing Jippy... Dancing Gypsies Port or something like that. So that's that's all that's that's all you're allowed to claim. So it kind of uh, I guess the word is like bastardizes um, your wine if you want to call it port. Otherwise, if you didn't want to do that and you wanted to say that you know there was an old wine Zinfandel from Fox Creek Vineyard or whatever from 2017, you'd have to call it like a late harvest or something else. But you couldn't call it a port. So um, so yeah, that, they have that going for them, which is kind of cool. Um, most popular wines are definitely the Erica's Reserve Zinfandel and the White Barbera. You guys will be able to taste the Erica's Reserve. That's kind of the crown jewel of Villa Toscano because Erica, um, of course, is one of the owners. So try to do our best on that one. Okay. Um, most all of the wines are estate grown and produced, of course. Uh, we have lots of classic Italian varieties, Sangiovese, Montepulciano, Barbera, Primitivos, and... Cab Sauv, Cab Franc, Viognier, Chardonnay, um, but that's all that we grow on the estate. We source grapes from our neighbor, Fox Creek, and that would be a Pinot Grigio, of course, and also some old vines in. Um, at Fox Creek Vineyard, those Zinfandel vines are just over 100 years old, so um, those definitely have a much more intense fruit flavor. Um, you guys will get to taste that in the Erica's Reserve because we did use Fox Creek Zin in that blend. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's fun to be able to work with those grapes because they are so intense and it's very different from what we grow just right next to them. So, so I appreciate that. You'll also be able to try the Montepulciano from Villa Toscano or excuse me, the Bella Piazza label of, uh, Montepulciano. So that's kind of a much darker, um, almost like the Petite Syrah of the Italian world. It's genetically related to Sangiovese, but much darker fruit, much more intense flavor, kind of inky color. So that's something different you guys will, will get to try. So I look forward to sharing that with you. Okay. So just because we make wine for both wineries does not mean that the wines are the same. Uh, we make very, very many different blends. So for Villa Toscano in general, the key for these wines are to be more for the general public. So they're much more fruit forward. Uh, lighter in body and a softer finish. So this is more of kind of um, social wine, uh, I guess table wine. This is um, in general just kind of wines that are designed for everyone to enjoy. You don't have to be a wine aficionado to enjoy this. Bella Piazza, on the other hand, is what Susan likes to say. She's the head winemaker um, who also consults at Sierra Vista. She likes to say that Bella Piazza is a little more serious, serious wine. So that would typically have darker fruit flavors, um, a little bit heavier body, and more tannins than the Villa Toscano wine, for sure. So that's kind of the overall difference between the two. Uh, for the flagships, the White Barbera and the Erica's Reserve, the White Barbera is made from red grapes. So that's uh, harvested, it's Barbera that's harvested very early. 
So the pH is low, the sugar is low when the acid is high. So it kind of makes it kind of an ideal white wine at that point. It's very crisp and refreshing. Um, kind of has like a medium plus body to it. So um, it's uh, it's kind of kind of feels like a red wine in your mouth, but tastes like a white. So it's, it's very interesting. But if you kind of like a really good balance of sweet and sour, I uh, definitely would recommend that. It's one of our most popular ones for sure. Erica's Reserve, like I said, is dedicated to the owner, Erica Wright. It's a traditional blend of the best zins of each vintage. Um, there's a lot of pressure behind us to perform on that because Erica has to like it personally <laughs> before we can send it out. So, of course, um, that's kind of, I guess you get that anywhere you go. But um, definitely a lot of work goes into that for sure. Um, this will typically include the Fox Creek Vines, which is an old vine zin, and maybe up to three different other zins made um, in different styles with different yeasts and fermentation processes. Um, in general, we try to display really bold fruit in medium tannins in this wine. So even though the Erica's Reserve is on the Villa Toscano label, it's one of the most serious wines that we have in the Villa Toscano label. So that makes it, makes it appealing. Okay, so how can a white wine be made from red grapes? You might be asking. Well, it is possible, and people do it all the time. Um, so what we do is we'll take uh, red grapes, we harvest the grapes, right? And then we press the grapes right away. So by pressing the grapes, you remove the skins from the juice. Um, then we put it into a tank, and we ferment it very coldly and very slowly. Uh, once the fermentation is complete... We keep the tank very, very, very cold, and we let the solids and the color settle out. And it actually does. It does sink to the bottom, and you'll get a clear product behind. Uh, basically, then you'd rack and repeat. In some cases, some cases you would add bentonite clay uh, and or activated carbon. Uh, it can be used to help assist in the color stripping as well. For the most important part of this process, uh, it's all important, but one of the big ones for color to avoid getting color in your wine is to harvest the grapes early so they haven't developed a lot of color in their skins, but also when you're pressing, not to press too hard. You'll lose some yield, you'll lose some juice in this process, but um, it's extremely important because you want to preserve as much of the flavors and aromas as possible without having to strip color and potentially strip some of those flavors and aromas later down the line. So that's very important. But yeah, that's... Pretty much, pretty much how it's made. You can kind of see this color right here, this pinkish color. So this looks like it could potentially become a white wine or a rosé. Um, but yeah, that should not alarm you. So we're, we're trying to avoid that color with the white Barbera. It's typically a couple shades lighter. But um, it is possible. We've done it before. Okay. I did want to talk about Rombauer Winery because uh, we are going to do a tour with them. So I want you guys to be educated and ready. Um, they also, even though they're founded in Napa, they actually have a really um, inspiring story in a lot of ways. Like, they're not just another big name out there. Um, so we'll learn about that. Uh, so I don't know how to pronounce this name. I'm sorry. Is it Kerner, Koner, uh, and Joan? They are the founders of Ron Bauer, 1980. So it started out, they started out as business partners at Con Creek. This is really common for people to team up with the winery um, and kind of use their facility and start making their own wine and paying them to do this until they can get on their feet, establish a name and a label, and get the, the funds to start their own winery kind of a deal. So they worked with Con Creek. They uh, worked with Stag's Leap. And eventually built up the funds to start their own facility, Rombauer. Um, they are related directly to Irma Rombauer. I believe it's uh, Kerner's aunt. And she's the author of The Joy of Cooking. Now, that is a very popular book in the United States, of course. If you haven't heard of The Joy of Cooking before, um, I definitely recommend it. It's a series of recipes, but um, it has a wonderful story attached to it. And the reason that we're talking about the joy of cooking is because Rombauer Winery has adapted this history and is trying to continue on with this legacy with what they're calling the joy of wine. 
So in their, I think it's their 40th year celebration this year or last year, um, their everything says the joy of wine on it. So they're trying to continue this legacy as much as they can. So Irma was a homemaker in St. Louis, Missouri, who very unfortunately lost her husband to suicide in 1930. Um, very tragic. Um, her children encouraged her to cook to help cope with the loss. Um, and thus a year later she wrote, she created a cookbook called the joy of cooking. Um, it, in that time period, it would have been extremely difficult for her just to go out and to find a job, um, to support her kids. Um, you know, it wasn't really necessarily the time and the age of women supporting families on their own. So for someone to have turned their life around, you know, in this, in this horrible time of sorrow and mourning, this is like no small feat. This is no small accomplishment whatsoever. Um, she was left with $6,000 after her husband's death. Um, after she finished the book, she paid half of that, three grand, to have 3,000 copies made by a small printing company. By the end of 1932, most all of the copies were sold. Uh, popularity gained, and now in today's age, there are nine editions and over 18 million copies sold. Um, this was, it's considered to this day the most popular American cookbook. Um, the original cover of the book is kind of fun. Um, so Irma and her daughter, uh, her daughter helped her create this, um, this cover. And this is, the cover is displaying her as the patron saint of cooking, slaying a dragon. So um, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Maybe it kind of helps to pick her battle with, um, you know, depression herself and mourning. But anyways, I just think for a woman of that time period to um, rise above and, you know, make the best of a situation, I think that's amazing. And I think it's cool that Ron Bauer, you know, still appreciates that to this day. So, yes, they're continuing the legacy of the joy of wine. Yep, here we go, celebrating 40 years of winemaking in 2020. They have two locations, of course. There's St. Helena in Napa, but there's also Steiner Road in Plymouth, and that's the one that we're going to for our tasting and tour. Um, they have five different vineyards. They have Atlas Peak, Bennett Lane, uh, Bookley Station, DeVito Ranch, and Stice Lane. So, kind of, they are very large. They are very competitive, um, very competitive company to work for as far as pay and benefits. Would definitely recommend it if you're interested in working there. Uh, very nice people, very professional, but, um, yeah, this company just has a lot going for it, so I, I appreciate that. Um, they also have a lot of high award-winning wine. They, their Chardonnay has, um, been on Wine Spectator's Top 100 Wines list, uh, 1993, it was number 68, 1995, uh, it was within the top 100 again, it was number 32, 2004, it was in Wine and Spirits Top 10 Chardonnays, and it ranked every year since then. They also produce Cabernet Sauvignon, Zinfandel, Barbera, and of course Merlot. So, um, be interesting to try their wines again. They do, from, from what I've seen last, I hope they still do have a fiddle town Zinfandel. So it'll be interesting to talk to them, but, um, yeah, just really, really an interesting story. And, um, that kind of, it touches me personally. Um, so anyways, if it inspires you, great. If it doesn't, then, you know, just more information for you. Um, but yes, that is what I have for Amador County. Um, you know, you're welcome to look deeper into it if you'd like to. Hopefully that kind of helped to give you a, a general idea of what we're going to work with when we do our tasting on Wednesday. Wednesday, we're planning on having a visitor, like a guest appearance on Zoom from Shenandoah Vineyards slash Saban. The Saban family will be here to talk to us. So if you have any questions about specific, you know, qualities of the region, he would definitely be an expert and be the one to talk to. So I um, hope you all can make it. I hope you all are very attentive and respectful. I know you will be. You guys are great. And I look forward to tasting with you guys. So yeah, I'll see you guys next time.